second that you accept that, that that nerdiness and that uniqueness of intelligence and physical strength of martial arts, for me, that's when I learned I'm Melissa, I'm a martial artist. Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 167, and I'm honored that you're here. On today's episode, we talk to Senpai Alyssa Gadisi, a Shotokan karate practitioner from Michigan with some awesome stories. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear. Here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best podcast on the traditional martial arts twice each week. Welcome. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm your host as well as the founder here at Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to the returning listeners, and welcome to those of you giving us a try for the first time. You can find our show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, and that's also the easiest place to sign up for our great newsletter. As a thank you for joining, we're going to send you our top 10 tips for martial artists, which is an exclusive podcast episode. Our newsletter keeps you up to date on what's going on here at Whistlekick, gives you some clues as to some upcoming show guests, and even discounts on our great products. I'm proud to announce the release of the first edition of the book version of our martial arts event course. How Not to Hold a Martial Arts Tournament is available on Amazon as a Kindle ebook and soon to be available in print. The advice in our book and course is equally applicable to events of all sizes and all styles. While much of the book and course talks about competition, the instructions will be just as helpful for other martial arts events like seminars. It was from a news article online that I first discovered Senpai Alyssa Gadisi. We've had some younger martial artists on the show, and she certainly fits that profile. Every one of them has a common thread, though. Their dedication to martial arts far surpasses their years. Senpai Gadisi showed a maturity in that news article that inspired me to reach out. We chatted a bit, and I knew that she belonged on the show. Which brings us to now. Senpai Gadisi, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. Oh, the honor is mine. I appreciate you coming on, and... We're going to talk about you. We're going to talk about your time in the martial arts and some things that you're looking forward to, hoping to make happen, and everything that is you and your time training. Now, of course... Okay, well, I hope I can give you some answers. <laughs> well, I'm sure you'll give some answers. I'm sure they're going to be wonderful answers because, you know what, it's your story, and your story is a wonderful story just as everybody's story is, and I'm kind of a nerd like that. I just like collecting stories and getting to talk to people. It's honestly, it's the best part of my job. But before we go forward, we need context for everything else that we're going to talk about today. And that's best answered by how did you get started in the martial arts? Well, I got started because like most younger siblings, I wanted to do anything my older brother did. My older brother had started classes at the YMCA when my mom took exercise classes and I was at daycare. Because he did it, I wanted to try it as well. So I would sneak behind the wall, the little divider wall between my daycare and his class, and I would copy him. I would punch and kick and do anything that the older kids got to do. And finally, my instructor caved because he was not accepting kids at my age. I was only six years old and let me join the class. And from then on, I just continued to do it. And I've been with the same instructor, Scott Demarest, at Lakeshore Martial Arts since then. So I've been doing it for 11 years now. And I've just been in love with it since then. It's just been an amazing experience for me. Awesome. So if you started because of your siblings, you know, you don't stick around for 11 years. I'm doing math. You're 17 or right in there. Maybe Mm -hmm. we got a couple months swing with with some birthdays. But if you stick with something for 11 years, you like it. There's something about it for yourself that you're enjoying. So what is that? Why do you keep training? Personally... I guess for me, it's the fact that you never stop learning. There's just always a new kick or a new punch or just a new life lesson that always comes around the corner that you weren't expecting. No matter what tournament you've been to or what rank you've achieved, there's just always something new to learn. And ever since I was six, that's just always been what drew me to it. It was the fact that you could walk out there and you could have your biggest win of the year and you still learn something against that opponent. And it just built such a self-confidence in yourself and just taught you really honestly how to grow up and how to be who you were going to be as a teenager and as a child. And it was just, and it, it just drew me to it personally, which is how much you got out of it. 
It just wasn't like the normal sports I played as a kid. What other sports did you play? I grew up playing volleyball and basketball, and I was a cheerleader, and I still am in high school. I'm a varsity competitive and sideline cheerleader. I show horses and rabbits, and I did the softball, and I, I, I tried it all as a child, and none of it gave me the same feeling as I get with martial arts, with just the feeling of self-confidence and having the power to not only defend yourself, but look graceful and powerful as you're doing it. It was just different, and I just loved it. Mm. Yeah, there's certainly something special about it. I don't need to tell you that, and I probably don't need to tell any of the listeners that. That's why they're listening. You know, I mean, that's why we do what we do is because there's just something magical about it that draws us in. Now, stories. I love telling stories. I love hearing stories even more, and that's kind of the format of this show, as all the listeners know, and as I've already prepped you. So, yeah, kind of dig into your memory banks a little bit. And tell us your best martial arts story. One of my best martial arts stories, or one of my personal favorites, I guess I should say, was when I was 10 years old. It was a local tournament at our local college, which is Muskegon Community College. And I was a green belt in Shotokan. And I was competing in it. And they combined the adults and the children together for this overall championship. Now, as a 10-year-old child, you don't think that you're going to have a chance. You're going to go in there and give it your best shot, but they're older than you, and you're expecting just to put your best fight up. I went in there with this thought, and I ended up tying with the man who was who I just looked up to and thought he was phenomenal for 10 rounds. We went 10 rounds back and forth in kata, and I was only a green belt, so by the time I hit my 10th kata, that was all I knew. I was just putting everything into it and we went 10 rounds and just gave it our all. And we kept tying with straight tens across the board. And it was just the biggest experience of my life. Cause it was the first time I was sent a ring and all eyes were on me. I didn't know that feeling of getting that rush of just the competition is watching you. Your judges are looking at you in awe and the whole crowd is just clapping every time you finish. So to tie 10 rounds with someone who was I, someone I looked up to and to finally not view him as a kind of the pinnacle of what you want to become, but as a competitor. And then to not only do that, but to prevail and to win was just a huge experience as a 10 year old girl to have that feeling of, wow, I can do this. And that really started my want to keep winning. It gave me that itch that I liked the feeling of winning. And it just made me want it even more. The competition just started to strive from there. Mm. So I know some things about you that we're going to learn as as a group. You know, your listeners, you're going to get to learn about Senpai Gadesi as we move forward. But it sounds like that was kind of the switch. That was, I'm guessing it was that moment that you said competing is something I really want to focus on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can hear I can hear it in the way that you're talking about it. And I'm personally impressed that someone... 10 years old as a green belt with four years under their belt had 10 katas to pull from. That's I, I, I certainly didn't after four years or, or at my green belt rank. So that's, that's pretty cool. You were, you certainly had, had uh, learned some, I think a little bit beyond your, your rank, your typical uh, green belt. So cool. Yeah. I was always the kid that wanted to learn more. I was always bugging my instructor after class, you know, what else can I learn? Is there a kata I can do? If I do this many push-ups, can I can I learn something new? Can I learn this hook kick? Or can I learn the next move to this form? And I just always wanted to learn more. So he just kept feeding it to me as much as I would take. And I just kept going with it. I can hear a little bit of myself in that. That was kind of the way I was. And uh, it's a blessing and a curse as an instructor when you have somebody who wants to learn more and more and more. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah, sure you're right exactly. now you're teaching so you can you can appreciate what it's like to be on the other side. That is definitely a fact. Now we know you love martial arts. We heard a little bit about sports and horses, rabbits. Are there any other hobbies? Is there anything else that you'd say you're really passionate about? Maybe not as passionate as martial arts, but anything that that comes close? Um 
outside of martial arts, I do really love my horse. I show a horse and I own one, and that is one of my largest passions. But I also love um, coaching and volunteering with Special Olympics. I help and volunteer at a at Wesley School for special needs kids, and I coached a basketball team, and I coached a poly hockey team, and a volleyball team. And that has been really my passion lately is to volunteer with them and just to embrace showing my love for sports and sharing it with them as a social outreach. And it's so much fun. Those kids are just amazing. And it's just such a neat experience to connect with them on a personal level and be kind of a mentor, but also a friend at the same time. Mm. It's just one of my favorite things to do. Do you find that you're pulling anything you've learned from martial arts over when you're working with them? Yes, I really am with my patience and the focus on pulling apart each skill, such as just passing a volleyball. I mean, just piecing it apart and being able to see the dynamics of the move as not just one move, but as 10 little things in one truly helps me to be able to teach them how to do it and how to get them to do it as correctly as possible. And it also just lets me be myself around them because I'm confident enough to lead it and lead the class or the team and still be myself and have a connection with them at the same time. It's hard to ride that line. You know, I, I listeners yeah. to the show know, you know, whether it's martial arts or it's CrossFit or it's gymnastics, you know, I have the opportunity to work with people and, and children quite often, and it's hard to find that balance. So I certainly a- applaud you for making those efforts and it sounds like you're successful with them. So that's great. And I'm sure all the people that you're working with are happy to have you. Thank you. You're welcome. Keep doing what you're doing. You're doing good stuff. <laughs> but let's switch it up now. You know, we, we've talked about some of the some of the good stuff in your life, and now we're going to go kind of down the other way a little bit. Everybody's mm-hmm. got challenges that they face throughout life. I'd like you to think about one or a time or however you want to answer this where things weren't great and how your martial arts training and experience helped you through that. Personally, for me, that would have to be, I'm a high school student. And I mean, everyone kind of experiences that kind of outcast feeling, I guess you could say. And for me, that was really my freshman and sophomore year of trying to find where to fit in and how to interact with your peers and the older kids as well. And I've always been in advanced classes. And so I was always in with the upperclassmen. And I was always outgoing, but I wasn't really sure how to be confident in front of them. And for me, that was really where my martial arts kicked in because it kind of gave me an identity of some sort. I was able to tap into that when kids would say, hey, you're that girl that does karate. And it was a conversation starter. It made me able to talk to my peers confidently about a subject that I was comfortable with. And also it gave me the confidence of switching my brain in a way to martial arts and being able to say I'm talking to them as a martial artist, as if I'm teaching a class, because that was really the difficult part of high school for me was fitting in and being confident in front of my peers in my classroom. So just being able to have that experience of going in front of thousands of people on a competition level and switching that over to a high school classroom Hmm. was really for me what helped and just having that outcast feeling diminish itself. Just, it was just the biggest part of me coming out of my shell in high school. Now, what if you've got somebody, I'm going to, I'm going to go off script, way off script now and, and ask you a little bit <laughs> more okay. about that because, you know, everybody can relate to, I'm guessing almost everybody can relate to what you're talking about there. And I, I remember absolutely what it was like being in high school, being known as the kind of smart, kind of nerdy kid who did karate, who sometimes was in the newspaper because he won a trophy. Right. And like, that was, that was my identity and that was challenging. So, you know, let's say there's a parent listening and their kids kind of going through the same thing, but they're not out on the other side of it yet. You know, they're in the middle and they're having a hard time. What would you want that kid to know? To embrace it, to embrace that identity of being that martial artist and being someone special, because in the long run, that's what's going to really get you somewhere in life. I mean, you, you can try to fit in as much as you want. And I know everyone says to be yourself, 
but really, I mean, embracing your intelligence and embracing that uniqueness of being a martial artist, because not everyone can do that. Not everyone has the drive and the determination and the humbleness to push through and achieve something of that measure of physical and mental strength. I mean, you just really embrace it and show everyone, this is what I can do. And I have a voice and I'm able to be independent and be myself and still feel confident. Because the second that you accept that, that that nerdiness and that uniqueness of intelligence and physical strength of martial arts, I mean, that's when you really learn. For me, that's when I learned, I'm Alyssa, I'm a martial artist, and I like school. I mean, that was really, for me, how I was able to stand up and say, I'm okay with this. I'm okay with being a little bit different. Because it is, it's a hard thing to do as a high schooler, but when you're able to do it, it makes you feel so much more comfortable with yourself and so much more confident in front of everyone. Hmm. Good advice for sure. Now, obviously, your first instructor, probably like almost everybody's first instructor, was that person that really pushed you off and, and, and helped you on your path to martial arts. But if we were to take them out of the mix, if I was to say, who's been the most influential person in your martial arts career, who would that be? For me, that'd have to be my parents. Because my parents were the people who supported me through it. They were the people that when I came home from just a rough class and I was crying that I was just physically tired, they were the ones that were saying, it's okay, you're going to go back tomorrow and you're going to be fine. They were the ones that challenged me that said, you know, hey, if you go to this tournament and you do well, you're, you, we'll let you, you know, go pick dinner or we're going to let you go tomorrow. We'll let you go an extra day. And they funded my career. I mean, not only mentally, but um, financially. The days where my dad had to stay home from my tournaments to fund me going to trips out of state or out of country. And the days my mom had to sacrifice social events to take me to these tournaments. They were the ones that really influenced me to do this and encouraged me to step outside of my box and try this new sport and not be the typical little girl that was the ballet dancer or the gymnast or something and just kind of spread myself out to something where I was the only girl in the room, but I could feel comfortable with that. They were just a huge confidence boost and a huge supporter in the realm of martial arts and everything else as well. Well, props to them for doing what they did. You know, I think a lot of us that grew up competing and, you know, really any kid that goes to martial arts has somebody to thank outside their instructor, whether it's their parents or, you know, a guardian, whoever's raising them, whoever's funding it, whoever's supporting them in that. Because yeah, sometimes classes are hard. You know, you mentioned that. And it's one of the things that comes up on the show kind of rarely because we don't, we don't talk about it very often, right? You know, sometimes classes are tough. Sometimes you come back and you're like, oh, why am I doing this? And of course you yeah. remember, you know, but there's, you know, there's, there's times that it's really helpful to have somebody to support you, to lean on, whether they're a martial artist or not, so you can keep moving forward because it, it's a journey, right? I mean, you've been doing it for 11 years. You know, that's... Yeah. That's... It's very much so just an incredible journey, ups and downs and everything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, m almost three quarters of your life. That's a long time. So, all right. Now, we've heard... You mentioned a bit about competition, you know, in your your, yeah. your big story at the beginning. You talked about competition. In fact, I think we've heard you talk about competition a little bit in almost every answer. So we know mm -hmm. competition is important to you, but why? Competition's always been important for me because it was to prove to myself that I could do this. I mean, it was going to the classes seven or six days a week. And putting in the blood and the sweat and the tears and the time and then going to this tournament and getting that score and going, holy crap, I can do this. I just got a nine and a half or an eight. And having the opposite effect and getting a six and going, wow, I still have a lot to work on. For me, the competition wasn't the trophy or the medal. It was the fact that I was going out there and proving to not only myself, but to my instructor and my parents and my peers that this is what I put all my effort into and your time is not being wasted on me. I was soaking up every little bit of knowledge and every little bit of time and using it to the best of my ability to prove that I was accomplishing something and that I was growing as not only a martial artist, but a person as well. 
Are you a competitive person outside of martial arts? Yes, I am very competitive <laughs> and I've always been self-driven. <laughs> Whether it was sports or schoolwork or just simply, I mean, being the best that I can has always been very important to me. Whether it was getting the A in the class or getting the trophy or just being overall the most fit that I can be, that has always been the biggest goal of myself is just to make myself the best that I can be. That can be a difficult identity to have as a teenager, can it? Yeah, it's very stressful. There's definitely been moments where it's just overwhelming. I've always found it ironic that, you know, in our formative years, we tend to value indifference. And as we age, it, it just completely flips. You know, I, I don't think there's any one point in time but I'll say that going into my 20s, that's kind of still where people were. And then as I came out of my 20s, it had changed for sure. And I hope you and, and if there are any other younger folks out there listening, don't compromise your capacity because other people are uncomfortable trying to live up to the standard that you're setting. Now, you mentioned international. So... You, Competition for you is not the community college nearby. It's on a much bigger scale, isn't it? Not anymore. Now it is. It's starting to grow and it's exciting and nerve wracking. Where's where is your favorite international event been? So far, my I've been out of state and out of the country. I've only been out of the country once. I've gone to Canada, and now this coming year, I'm hoping to go to the next world championship wherever they choose to hold it. Uh, interna or nationally, my favorite place that we had to have competed was Florida because it was just a new experience. That was the furthest I've ever gone, and we competed in Orlando, and it was just a new surrounding, and the people were so different. Internationally, when I went to the World Championship in Canada in Hamilton, there it was just such a diverse culture that it was so different. Competing against girls from Sweden and also people from um, Pakistan, and there was a couple people from Brazil and um, Canada and Mexico and stuff. It was just a whole new culture shock for a little girl from a tiny town in Muskegon called Muskegon, Michigan. It was just so strange to me. Yeah. Having the opportunity to compete against people from all over the world is is a lot of fun. It's exciting. And I've had a little bit of that opportunity. I don't think quite as much as you, the events that I attended as a kid and, you know, as an adult, didn't attract quite that much international competition. But there's something to be said for looking at the way different people present themselves in competition. There's a lot to learn there. Now, outside of competition, if you had the opportunity to train with anybody, they can be alive, they can be dead, they can be anywhere in the world, who would you want to train with? For and someone who has passed away, I, I'm not sure, but a current person who's a big competitor that I look up to is Luca Valdezzi from Italy, Team Italy. He is just such a strong kata competitor that it makes me itch to learn more. I just would love to sit down with him one day and ask him, how do you make it look that sharp? How do you make it look so fluid? There's just something about the way that he performs kata that it tells a story. And it's one of my biggest goals for someone to watch me and be able to see every emotion that I put into a move. And he's just so passionate when he does it and so successful at showing that strength and the time that went into every single little movement that I would love to sit there one day and just pick his brain and see how he got there and how much effort it took to put a beautiful kata together like that. Because that is my favorite division. I love kata. And seeing someone like Luca Valdezzi, who is just so successful at portraying all of the ideals of kata into a single move sometimes, would just be incredible. Even if I got it for just 10 minutes, I would soak up everything. Mm -hmm. 
I'll make sure to find some video of him doing kata and post it over on the show notes. If anybody's unfamiliar with, with what we do, over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, you can find show notes with links to things that we talk about today. You know, it's a great opportunity to put in video and other things that you can't see on an audio show, right? So we'll drop some video in there, head on over there and check it out. That's a great choice and certainly one that kind of lines up with what you're talking about and and what I know about you. So cool. All right. So kind of a, more of a fun, lighter question. Martial arts movies. Do you have any favorites? Honestly, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm going to be a stereotypical person and say the karate kid just because that's the traditional thing to say. But well, in all reality, one? I'm not sure if I have. The original, of okay. course. All right. But I'm not sure if I particularly have a favorite. I mean, I, of course, have my favorite fight scenes with people such as Van Damme when he does the Van Damme kick just because I learned how to do that. And I think it's one of the <laughs> coolest, you know, just movie kicks that you can do. <laughs> but, I mean, then you have Zoe Saldana, who's not a martial artist, but she just has some amazing fight scenes. And I yeah. couldn't really choose a favorite movie. I just have my favorite moves inside of movies that I can see. We talked to... Uh... I forget what episode number it is, but quite a while back, we had the opportunity to talk to Master Ken and, and the man behind Master Ken, Matt Page, and he talked about mm -hmm. queuing up fight scenes to various movies. And, you know, he's he's closer to my age, so we grew up without DVD. So VHS tapes queued up to the his favorite fight scenes so he could watch them once or twice before he got on the bus to go to school. <laughs> oh, reminded, reminded me of that. Yeah, I mean, sometimes the best martial arts movie is really, it's not the movie, is it? It's its the fight scenes. Yeah, it's definitely that one move that you watch and you go, wow, that was just spectacular. That was so clean and crisp. That really gets you about the movie. Are there any actors other than Jean-Claude Van Damme that you appreciate? He's really the one that sticks out to me just because of the fact that he does most of his own stunt scenes, and I think that's what draws me to him. Mm. But other than that, I'm not really sure who else I would appreciate on just right off, you know, when you think of someone and their name just clicks in your head. Yeah. He's really the one that, to me, sticks out. Did you see the new Kickboxer? Yes, I the did. What did you think? I thought it was good. The fight scenes, to me, held up to his past movies, but some of his other ones were more of my favorite ones. I found it impressive that he he still had it. I mean, yeah. Once the fight scene started, it was it was Van Dam. It was it could have been Van Dam from the eighties. Exactly. They were still. I mean, the stamina and the technique was still there. Yeah, yeah it's you know I I think that that's a true test of a martial artist when they go into movies. I mean, you can't you can't take the martial arts out of the martial artist. That should probably no, be a t shirt cannot. somewhere, but. <laughs> <laughs> now how about books are there any martial arts books you've read that you would um, recommend I've read quite a lot Okay. pardon I, I tacked on that you would recommend Um, I recommend for someone that, of Shotokan I really liked um, Funakoshi's book of Karate Do My Way of Life just because it really shows how he got into it and just the background of his style but I mean there's also ones that I've read about samurai life and even just applications. But that for me was one that really stuck out and kind of showed me the background to his knowledge. Mm -hmm. But the book of five rings is another one that I really, really enjoyed. So I don't know. I feel like I've read more books than I have movies. <laughs> and that's okay. I mean, th those are two great answers and they're books that are mentioned on the show, you know, quite frequently. And so listeners, if you haven't read those books, come on, if, if you got to read them, you got to try, even if you're not a reader, give it a shot. You know, you book of five rings is, is such an old book. You can probably find a free version somewhere or, you know, at a used bookstore and karate do my way of life is not a thick book. It's not a difficult read and you should be able to find that pretty inexpensively. So let's talk about you moving forward what's what's keeping you motivated you know 11 years in 
you know, you're at a, a challenging time in your life. If, if you value your academics, which you've talked about, I'm guessing college is on the radar. So it's a busy time for you. You haven't stepped away from your martial arts training. You're still going at it. So there's got to be a reason. So what's keeping you moving forward? For me, it's, I have this picture um, from Florida and it's this little girl and she's sitting at the corner of the mat and she's watching me and she's in every single one of my pictures from that day. And that's really what keeps me going forward is just the fact that I'm not only accomplishing my dreams of moving into the Olympics, hopefully, but I'm also inspiring other kids to move that way as well. And that's really, for me, what's been driving me for this goal. I wanted to go to the Olympics since I was six. I told my mom, Mom, I'm going to the Olympics. And, you know, you're a six-year-old little kid. Your parents are going to say, okay, honey, you know, you, you do that. And now I'm 17, and I contacted the coach. Well, the coach contacted me and my USA coach from uh, my U USSA league and set up a meeting, and they're hoping to get me there. And it's a true goal of mine to – be able to pursue the Olympics in 2020 and hopefully be one of the 60 or so that go for Kata or Kumite fighting because that would be the true accomplishment of all of my effort of the 11 years going into just one three-minute match. Just that drive of being on the biggest stage. It's just everything I've ever dreamed about is to stand on that mat and bow in and just have that three minutes of just awestruck, I've done it. And have all the kids looking at you and even your peers of saying, she did this, I can do it too. And that's really, for me, what inspires me to keep pushing and to overcome the adversity and just keep striving for that goal of the Olympics. So you mentioned the, the moment. There was a, th a, a bit in what you said that reminded me of, of why I reached out to you because listeners, you know, this show is at a point now where a lot of the guests are recommended from listeners or they're people that come to us and say, Hey, you know, I, I love the show. I want to come on. And that's fun. And that, that's a great place for us to be at, to have people looking at the show with so much value that they want to be part of it. And that just makes me feel so good. But that doesn't mean that there aren't people that pop up on the radar that I say, I want this person on the show. And Senpai Gadisi is one of those people. As I was crawling around Google News, digging through articles and seeing what stuff maybe we would post on social media, I came across an article from a local paper talking about you and your goal for the Olympics and the that brief anecdote of you at six years old telling your parents that you wanted to be in the Olympics. And of course, karate wasn't an Olympic sport. It wasn't even on the radar for being an Olympic sport back then. But here no, we are now. And, and, and to me, that's there, there's something there. There's something just that, that made a couple of hairs on the back of my neck stand up and I said, this is cool. And so that's when we started talking. And of course, listeners, that brings us to now. So I'm, I'm behind you. I want to see this happen. What has to happen between now and 2020 for us to get to watch you? Honestly, I just have to keep striving and I need to build up more strength physically to match my opponents from Brazil and Italy that are just very strong competitors. And I really need to just keep winning and to keep showing people that I want to do this I can do this and I'm willing to put in the work to do it. It's just the fact of getting in front of the correct people that will watch me and take time out of their day to listen to me say, Hey, I'm here. I'm willing to put in a thousand kicks and a thousand punches. And I will sit here and do one kata for five hours. If you will just give me the shot to prove to you that I can do this. I just have to keep winning and keep striving and keep, pushing forward as quickly as I can to make it to these trials in time. Have they finalized what the selection process is like? Do you, do you know how this all goes? What I've heard so far is that it's going to be an open trials. And the, what I heard last was that location and date was to be determined. 
and that they're going to have an open trials competition to basically who wins and who's the top competitors are going. I have some very amazing coaches that are willing to put in the effort and are traveling actually from all over Michigan and some out of state to get me there and to train me. And now I'm just branching out and getting all of this advice and coaching from people who just messaged me and said, I think you have the ability and they're willing to try to work with me to get me in front of these coaches. And it's just going to be getting in front of them and then making it to these trials to try and go to the open trials and place is really what I need to do. Okay. When do they have anything close to a when for that? You know, is it this year? It will. Is it next year? It will be within the next few years. Okay. I mean, obviously sometime this year or next year. There was the first one for the uh, USA team was actually not too long ago. Okay. And I saw that, I think it was a month ago, I saw the first like trials for the team. And I'm hoping that I will be able to make it to one of the new, one of the more recent ones that are coming up. It's just the difficulty of funding it and paying for myself to travel to wherever they're going to hold them. Yeah. Yeah. It's certainly a challenge. Cool. So, you know, you've mentioned funding a couple times. If anybody wants to stay up on what's going on, you know, I don't know if you're going to open up like a GoFundMe or something like that, but if that was on the radar, people wanted to stay up on what you're doing. How might they do that? They can contact me through Facebook under just my name, Alyssa Gavisi, or they can go through my Instagram account, and I, I can send you the link to that. Yeah, we'll, we'll so drop that links. Posted. Yeah, we'll drop links to those in the show notes. Yeah, and basically, I mean, just search up my name, and most of my stuff can be found there. I mean, my profile as a martial artist and just as a person myself. And I had a GoFundMe page for my last tournament in Florida, and that went pretty well from just my community. I mean, I was just a local kid then, and I'm hoping that if I get the chance to go to the trials, that I will probably open another one, and it will be linked on my social media accounts as well. Okay, well, hopefully we can help support you a little bit because, you know, I'm not going to get to go to the Olympics, you know, if... (laughs) Had I been six years old and I had I set out that goal and, you know, had it been 20 years ago, maybe that would have been an option. But um, I've kind of aged out from that. I'm, I'm, it would take me longer than two years to get ready. We'll, we'll put it that way. But personally, you know, I'm planning to support you however I can because you're you're doing the right things for the right reasons. And listeners, I hope that when it comes time, you know, when we put out the call that you'll be willing to help out, you know, as longtime listeners know, we don't do this often. You know, it's, it's not often that we'll support a, a, a person or a cause because there are so many good ones, but once in a while, something will pop up that just really resonates for me. And this is one of those. Now, as we start to wrap up here, we always like to end by giving the listeners some advice. What advice would you give the people that are listening to you right now? My advice is just simply to never let yourself stop learning because there's always something else to soak up and just basically remember to always be a role model to always just be humble and work hard no matter if anyone's watching or not because you never know when there's a little girl or boy that's sitting on the sideline or watching from around the corner wanting to be just like you when you grow up because truthfully that's what we're doing we're setting a future for not only ourselves but for the next generation that is coming up behind us And that's really the goal of martial arts is just to build it up and keep it growing for years to come. Like most of our guests, we have here a passionate martial artist who has no trouble describing their love for what they do. On the other hand, Senpai Gadisi's focus and dedication are not typical of individuals her age, or to be honest, of any age. She's an exceptional person and someone I greatly enjoyed speaking with. Thank you, Senpai Gadisi, for coming on the show. Over at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com, you can find the show notes with photos, links to Senpai Gadisi social media, and more. I even found video of that tournament competitor that Senpai Gadisi spoke so highly of. There's a video of him doing a kata called Empi, which was one of my favorites growing up. Definitely worth checking out.
You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram. And our username is Whistlekick. You should also check out our Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio Behind the Scenes. If you like the show, please be sure you're subscribing. And if you're up for giving something back, you can share the show with friends, leave us a review, join the newsletter list, get in on that Facebook group, like Whistlekick on Facebook, or make a purchase. Those are the best ways you can help us out. Really, what it comes down to the most, though, if you appreciate what we do, that's the best thing for me. Head on over to Amazon and check out the book form of our martial arts event course. Or if you want the whole course with dozens of templates, tracking forms, and everything you need to put on the best martial arts event ever, visit KarateTournamentBook.com. I appreciate you spending some time with me today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.